Welcome to this cultural awareness training course on Japan. Your course is broken up into eight chapters, which you can see on the screen at the moment. Under each chapter, you'll have a certain number of topics. It's important to go through the course chapter by chapter and topic by topic, rather than skip between sections. By skipping between topics, you may miss important information that was covered earlier in the presentation. We recommend you first follow the default learning path and, once completed, come back to particular sections in your own time. At the end of some of the chapters, you will have some quizzes. Your scores from the quizzes will go towards your final assessment and certification. This course has been designed for anyone working, doing business, or in some other professional context, interacting with people from Japan. You may be working in a company with Japanese colleagues, selling to Japanese clients, managing Japanese staff, or visiting the country in a professional capacity. The course covers topics relevant for anyone wanting to use cultural insights to their advantage. In the course, we'll cover areas such as how to communicate, explore typical cultural challenges for foreigners, and provide tips on how to maximize your potential when working with Japanese colleagues, clients, and peers. As well as this, we'll also be discovering more about the history, people, culture, and values of Japan. All these insights will help build a comprehensive picture of the country and people, as well as how they like to do business. Above all, this course will help you develop fruitful relationships unspoiled by misunderstandings and miscommunication. It will help you make good decisions untainted by cultural misunderstandings. This is the topic of our next chapter, culture, and why it's important to focus on cultural awareness. Before we look at Japan in detail, it's important we set some frameworks in terms of how to approach the idea of culture and the contents of this course. So, in this chapter, we're going to be exploring the concept of culture, how we see the world, and how making generalizations about cultures can be both helpful and a hindrance. Let's begin with culture. What is it? Well, culture essentially describes the shared beliefs, values, expectations, and behaviors that set a particular group of people apart from others. We can see culture in areas such as language, dress, art, music, architecture, and food. However, these rarely cause problems when it comes to working with people from different cultures. Problems usually arise from those bits of culture that we can't see. These unseen cultural differences are typically driven by our values and the much deeper influences of culture. They shape and inform the way people think and behave and are learned through sources such as education, family, media, and religion. It's these unseen cultural factors that this training will be focusing on. This will help you better understand and prepare for how to deal with some of the more common challenges experienced by newcomers to Japan and the culture. The cultural lens is a valuable analogy to help us understand the way in which people of different cultures view and interpret the world. We all interpret the world through our own distinctive cultural lens. Imagine that you're looking at the world through a pair of glasses with a distinctively colored filter. This filter will color the way you perceive and interpret situations. Those with different colored filters will likewise perceive and interpret the same situation in their own way. These lenses shape our reality and expectations of others, which means that very often we see the world as we see ourselves. It's in this way that different cultures view the world. Our cultural lenses differ in respect to what should be considered, what should be ignored, what is right or what is wrong. Individuals with little cultural awareness typically assume that the lens they look through is the same one that everyone else looks through. Therefore, they judge others by these standards. When they come across people who do not conform to these standards, then 
it's likely that they perceive the behavior of that person as strange, wrong, or abnormal. Be aware, therefore, during your time in Japan or when working with the Japanese, to check the assumptions you're making. Are these assumptions driven by your own cultural expectations and presumptions? Are you judging people or events against a set of standards that do not apply to them? This training will help draw your attention to these potential cultural traps and give you more useful frameworks in which to base your judgments. Now, it's important to stress that people in Japan don't all view the world through a single cultural lens. The colour of a person's lens can vary depending on many factors, such as their gender, social class, or the region they're from. With this diversity in mind, although we may in some cases use broad brushstrokes when talking about culture, be aware that we don't wish to stereotype the Japanese. It's important that you're mindful throughout this training that culture is fluid and ever-changing, and that the Japanese are no different in this respect. Although many people will behave and perceive the world within the frameworks we discuss, it won't be the case for everyone. Making generalizations is impossible. However, we are able to work with probabilities based on the challenges that many foreigners face. It's key, therefore, to take the information in this training as more of a, a safety net in terms of helping you understand the Japanese. It is not and cannot be a guide to understanding every single Japanese person you meet. So, in this chapter, we've explored culture and now appreciate that cultural awareness is very much about coming to understand the drivers and reasons behind behaviour, thoughts and actions. It's not simply about learning to bow or, or shake hands. By using culture as a framework of understanding, it can help us reduce the impact of our own cultural lenses when interpreting Japanese people's behaviours. We also discussed the fluidity of culture and the need to be mindful of approaching individuals without preconceived ideas and judgments based on stereotypes or, or generalisation. Well, this brings us to the end of this chapter. In the next chapter, we'll be exploring Japan in detail, looking at areas such as their history, language, and beliefs to give us some context in which to understand the people. In this chapter, we're going to be learning a bit about Japan to give us some context that will really help us explain upcoming topics. As with any country or culture, Japan has been shaped by its past as well as its physical environment. Understanding this helps us understand the Japanese today. So, in this chapter, we're going to be giving you a crash course on Japanese geography, history, language, and beliefs. Lastly, we'll be taking a peek at what defines modern Japan. Japan is an island nation located in the Pacific Ocean off the far east coast of the Asian continent. To the Japanese, the country is known as Nihon or Nippon, which loosely translates into English as Land of the Rising Sun. Its closest neighbours are China, South Korea and Russia. The country itself is made up of many islands, however, there are four main islands. Hokkaido, Shikoku, Kyushu and Honshu, which is the mainland. The capital city is Tokyo with other major cities including Yokohama, Osaka and Nagoya. About 80% of the 127 million population live on Honshu Island. With more than 70% of the island being mountainous, the little flatland in the country is heavily populated. One of the key features to understand about Japan is the deep connection between the physical geography of the country and its people. Due to being an island nation, cut off from outside influence and with a natural tendency to be insular, Japan has remained ethnically one of the most homogenous countries on earth. Some 99% of its inhabitants are ethnically Japanese. This has created an interesting bond between the people and their land. For example, the four seasons are a very important part of Japanese culture. 
Marking the change in seasons is important even in modern day Japan. Certain recreational events take place, as well as celebrations and rituals centered around acknowledging the particular seasonal phase. Food, in particular, is used to mark a change in season, with supermarkets constantly producing seasonal snacks and treats to mark the time of year. Another aspect of Japan's geography that has had implications on the culture is the fact that the country is very prone to natural disasters. Throughout the ages, earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, typhoons, and volcanic eruptions have become part and parcel of life in Japan, which has had a deep impact on the people's psyche and their values. The Japanese highly value the concept of ganbaru, which roughly translates as persistence. For example, after the devastating tsunami of 2011 in Japan, many firms turned towards ganbaru and used it as a slogan to encourage workers to get through the tough times. It's this struggle with nature over many generations that has promoted this shared value between the Japanese. A key learning point at this stage is to consider the impact that being an island nation with tough conditions has had on the people living there. The Japanese are very connected to their land and especially to the natural world. Respecting nature, acknowledging its influence and trying to live in harmony with it are all aspects of modern Japan we see today. Despite being an island nation and very much insular, Japan has played a major role in world events and politics. Getting to know a bit about their ancient and modern history further helps us shape our understanding of the people. This is what we'll be looking at in the next topic. Japan has a very long, rich and complex history. For the purposes of this training, learning every detail about Japanese history is not essential. However, what is essential is understanding some basics. It's these basics that will help us really get under the skin of the Japanese and start to appreciate how they may see the world and how their values have been shaped. So, Rather than look at specific historical events and timelines, we're going to focus on some themes of interest. Firstly, let's take ourselves back to the beginnings of Japan. At this time in history, food was the primary commodity, and in Japan, food was rice. Whoever controlled rice production essentially held power. This led to the start of small, independent kingdoms across Japan, which were slowly consolidated over time into larger and larger kingdoms, before all islands eventually came under single rule. Over this time, a unique hierarchy was established that essentially maintained social order. On the screen, you'll see a chart illustrating how society was essentially arranged during the Edo period, which ran from 1603 to 1868. For hundreds of years, Japan was essentially broken down into four classes. The warriors, the farming peasants, artisans, and merchants. At the top of all this sat the emperor, who over time simply became a symbol of power. The real power in Japan sat with the warriors, known as the samurai. A key learning point here is to consider the impact these deep roots in a hierarchical society will have on a people. For example, it's interesting to note a similar structure can still be seen today in many of Japan's most modern businesses. A symbolic figurehead typically represents a company. They usually have little or no power and are more the face of a company. As with Edo society, Businesses are actually run by a group of senior executives who have the real power. They're also responsible for the division of labour and maintaining structure and harmony within the business. A major event in Japanese history that accounts for much of their cultural uniqueness stems from a period of time known as Sokoku, which is roughly translated as closed country. 
From the 1630s, Japan was essentially cut off from the world for 220 years. Other than some trade agreements and similar exceptions, the Japanese were not allowed to leave Japan, and foreigners could not enter. This had a profound impact on Japan and the people, as the country essentially went through a process of introspection and consolidation of the local culture. It's in these years that the Japanese defined and refined what it meant to be Japanese. The results are what we still see today in traditional Japanese beliefs, traditions, dances, clothing, food, and almost all aspects of Japanese life. Japan's modern story perhaps helps us understand why Japan is the way it is today. After coming out of isolation at the end of the 19th century, Japan, over the coming decades, became a regional superpower and soon realised its ambitions to create an empire at the expense of China and Korea. This led to Japan's involvement in the Second World War and their eventual defeat. After the war, the country in some ways returned to its previous insular approach to maintaining structure in society. However, this time, Rather than shut itself off, it's now one of the world's key players, boasting some of the world's largest global brands. So, when thinking about Japan today and how their culture is expressed, always remember that history has played a large role in shaping it. In coming topics, when we talk about hierarchy in Japan, we're able to now understand the roots behind this. Similarly, when we come to talk about the Japanese communication style and its very indirect nature, we're able to see that this has roots in the very ordered makeup of Japanese society. If you'd like to discover more about Japanese history, make sure you have a look at the resources we've added for you. The more you can understand about the past, the more you'll be able to understand about Japan's present. All Japanese people speak Japanese, which is known as Nihongo. As with any language, Japanese has many spoken dialects. The Tokyo and Osaka dialects are the most common and are understood widely by the entire population. When written, Japanese is very much standardised, other than in regional marketing or advertising, where colloquial phrases may be adopted. The Japanese writing system consists of three scripts that are often mixed together when writing. History again has a lot to do with this. Kanji is the written system based on Chinese characters. Hiragana is a uniquely Japanese writing system that came later based on indigenous characters. However, it's still used alongside Kanji. The last system, called Katakana, is used to write foreign words, names, and loan words, which have been mainly derived from English, French, Portuguese, and other languages. When learning Japanese, the hiragana and katakana scripts are learnt first, and then once a student is confident in both writing and speaking, kanji is introduced. For foreigners, learning to speak Japanese can be relatively easy thanks to simple grammar and pronunciation. However, where Japanese gets difficult for a foreigner is in mastering the complicated writing system and honorific systems known as keigo and kenjugo. Keigo is an honorific system used by the Japanese to show politeness and respect. It has both a written and spoken form. Depending on the social status of an individual, the speaker will change their choice of words and verb conjugations to reflect the receiver's social status and to show respect. For example, speaking or writing an email to your boss would involve speaking or writing an email very differently to that of a colleague of equal status. Kenjugo, on the other hand, refers to the more informal written system between peers. Although English is mandatory at schools, the percentage of Japanese who are proficient in spoken English is quite low. This is on one hand due to the limited need to speak English, unless it's part of your everyday work. On the other hand, the way English is taught heavily relies on correct grammar, syntax and vocabulary. 
it's common to find that Japanese may be able to write impeccable emails, yet on the telephone or in a face to face meeting may use an interpreter. The Japanese language is closely tied to its culture. It influences it and is influenced by it. As we'll come to see in the next topic when we explore Japanese beliefs and religion, the use of language is fundamental in attaining harmony in this life and the next. There are two main religious influences upon the Japanese that help us in continuing to build a picture of their culture and the influences behind them. The first is that of Shinto, which is Japanese in origin. The other is Buddhism, which came to Japan from India via the Chinese. Over the course of time, the Japanese came to practice both in tandem, creating synergies between the belief systems and their teachings. Let's first start with Shinto. Shinto is indigenous to Japan, however, it's not strictly a religion per se. Some see it as、uh, more of a philosophy or a, a way of life. Shinto, in essence, is a set of life practices and guidelines against which to live your life. It connects the Japanese to events in the natural world, their ancestors, and traditions of old. Births and marriages are celebrated at Shinto shrines, and attaining purity and respect for one's environment is central to Shinto beliefs. Followers visit Shinto shrines to pay respect to spirits that are enshrined within the grounds. Shrines are a place for Dedication and safeguarding objects rather than a place of worship. Shinto, in some ways, is a guide to leading the perfect Japanese life. Buddhism, on the other hand, is about the afterlife, and perhaps it's this that explains the reason why the two coexisted so easily in Japan. Buddhism follows the teaching of Buddha and concerns itself with finding enlightenment. Similarly to Shinto, it also teaches a basic moral code and provides a guide to success in the afterlife. Since World War II, Japan has become an increasingly secular country, and the practice of Buddhism has slowly waned. Interestingly, however, whereas most Japanese celebrate births with Shinto ceremonies, deaths and funerals are, on the whole, Buddhist in practice. This perfectly illustrates the seamless manner in which the Japanese have blended the two for their own unique circumstances. Although religion does not play a very significant role in modern day Japan, it does help explain many of the cultural traits found in the country. Today, the expressions of Shinto and Buddhism we see are largely symbolic, ceremonial, and cultural, rather than being driven purely by religious intentions. Many of Japan's holidays and celebrations come directly from the two religions. For example, the Setsubun festival in February is Shinto in nature, marking the coming of spring. A major date on the Japanese calendar is the Obon festival in August. This Buddhist practice sees the Japanese honoring the spirits of their ancestors en masse. By way of summary, we can say that Japanese society and culture have Very much been shaped by Shinto and Buddhism. Today, however, they've been blended and diluted into a very Japanese approach to understanding this life and the next. It's this that has given us what is modern day Japan, the focus of our next topic. Today's Japan is highly modernized. However, it's important not to confuse modernized with globalized. Although very much in touch with global politics, commerce, and culture, Japan is still very much Japanese. By this, I mean that outside influences have had very little impact on the country, and what we see today is very much still deeply rooted in the country's past. There's still very much a Japanese way of doing things. This is perhaps most visible in the country's education system. Within compulsory education, all students follow two lines of learning. Students are taught and examined in subjects such as Japanese literature, maths, science, and technology. 
On top of this, they carry out group activities such as cleaning toilets, handing out lunches, and extracurricular activities. The Japanese are taught from a very young age how to cooperate and how to work as part of a team for the greater good. The individual's role is secondary to that of the needs of the group. This is visible in a number of ways in modern Japanese organisations and businesses. Another aspect of the education system that has carried on into the business world is a sense of place. A hierarchy and a system exist that governs how people behave with one another. Teaching methods are based on a learning style that focuses on memorising facts. This is what's needed in order to pass exams. Creativity, application and deductive reasoning are still not necessarily emphasised within learning. And as a result, Japanese employees seem to have an organic aversion to making quick decisions or judgment calls. They find comfort in having instructions and clear guidance. So, how do we summarise Japan? Well, the country is one of the most advanced in the world and contributes to world culture through film, pop music, video games, art and cartoons. Despite this, however, Japan is still very much an island with its own mentality and its own way of doing things that keeps it grounded and connected to the land and its past. Well, this brings us to the end of this chapter. We now know a lot more about Japan in terms of its story and some of its defining characteristics. This has given us the context now to dig a bit deeper into understanding the people and the values that drive them. This is what we'll be covering in the next chapter. In this chapter, we're going to be learning more about a few of the main values shared by the Japanese. It's often many or a combination of these values that shape and drive much of Japanese behaviour and cultural traits. First, let's start with ganburu, gamon, and konju. These can be translated as persistence, endurance, and willpower. Japan's isolated and inhospitable landscapes have, over time, resulted in these qualities being seen as essential to life. One must strive, make effort, and overcome. It's these values, perhaps, that drive much of the innovation that comes out of Japan in sectors such as robotics, software, and IT. The Japanese stress collective achievement, which holds that anything is possible when everyone pulls together with a shared vision and works as a group. Another value that has its roots in the sometimes brutal experiences the Japanese have faced at the hands of natural and man-made disasters is that of shogunai. Shogunai can roughly be translated as it can't be helped. It's an acceptance of fate and that sometimes things are just out of your control. The Japanese mentality, therefore, is that when something is or appears to be out of your control, then you must accept it and move on. In some ways contradictory to the values of persistence and endurance, however, shogunai is more a belief that in life there are greater powers at work. Rather than complaining about things out of your control, you should channel your energies elsewhere. This, to a certain extent, explains the often stoic nature of the Japanese when faced with disaster. Our next value is motanai, which means something along the lines of what a waste. Again, closely tied to the Japanese experience of living on an island with limited resources, the Japanese feel regret towards waste of any kind. It expresses guilt when wasting something considered worthy. This might be wasted food, wasted time, or a piano that hasn't been played in a long time. All are motanai. Our next two values are perhaps the most important in understanding the Japanese culture. Both are interrelated and dependent upon one another. But for the sake of simplicity, let's start with wa, which means harmony. Harmony was essential for the Japanese throughout history 
as a way of maintaining stability. The teachings of Buddhism and Shinto beliefs also came together to stress peaceful unity with others. At its core, Wa dictates that the harmony and needs of society take priority over personal opinions or interests. This value heavily influences much of the Japanese mindset. If you're from a culture where people are encouraged to express themselves freely, the Japanese can be rather confusing. This is especially so when we consider the next values of honne and tatemai. Honne can be roughly translated as meaning the truth, in that people say what they really think about something. Tatemai, on the other hand, is about what you need to say to maintain face or group harmony when you represent a group. Tatemai is more about what you say in public as opposed to private. The two can contradict one another. Honne and tatemai are often core themes in Japanese TV soaps, films and novels, showing its central importance in day-to-day -day life. For foreigners, this behaviour can be interpreted negatively, and some cultures might even perceive it as lying or deceitful, because people aren't saying what they think. However, for the Japanese, it's tightly connected with the need to maintain harmony and seeing the bigger picture. For the foreigner, working with the Japanese in a professional context, it's therefore vital to appreciate that people may sometimes be saying what they need to, as opposed to what they want to. For the Japanese to be able to speak honestly, without fear of disturbing harmony, there must be a strong personal relationship. The Japanese make a distinction between uchi, the in-group, and soto, the out-group. People speak honestly with their in-group, but rarely do so to anyone outside of this group. For foreigners, being in the out-group, this can cause challenges in terms of getting accurate information. However, it's not impossible. Trust can be built by socialising with Japanese colleagues, clients or peers in safe spaces where people can talk freely. This is often done away from the office, over food, drinks and sharing fun such as at uh, karaoke bars and izakaya, which is the Japanese drinking houses. So, in this chapter, we've now been able to make the link between Japan's past and some of the values that are shared by many Japanese people, stressing peace and harmony, stability, and the need to sacrifice personal truths and ambitions for the collective good. The Japanese have developed a whole way of thinking, being, and behaving that is geared towards making things happen for the group. In the next chapter on doing business in Japan, we'll be able to start making connections between the Japanese approach to business and many of these values we've just covered. In this chapter, we're going to be focusing on communication in Japan. In particular, we're going to be looking at the Japanese communication style and some of the reasoning behind it. The first thing to understand about the Japanese communication style is that it relies heavily on context. A high context communication culture is usually found in ethnically homogenous countries that are very group orientated and promote group harmony. As we know, Japan is definitely one of these. In high context cultures, the people have formed subtle non verbal means of communication that allow people to say or not say things in order to maintain harmony and save face. Rather than rely on what is said, High context cultures rely on how something is said. It relies on intuition and the ability to read the atmosphere. Where two people come from the same cultural background, this works perfectly well, as both sides understand the rules. When the same approach to communication isn't shared, however, this can lead to confusion and some challenges. This is why, when communicating with the Japanese, it's so important not to concentrate solely on the words. You need to pay attention to eyes, 
body language, use of intonation, use of silence, and be much more aware of context. A distinct feature of high context cultures is that their communication style is very diplomatic and indirect. For some foreigners, Japanese communication can appear vague or ambiguous. They can appear to express themselves either in very short snippets that do not provide enough information, or use long sentences full of indirect clauses. The purpose, essentially, is to mask having to say the absolute truth. Remember, for the Japanese, the absolute truth may mean jeopardising group harmony, disrespecting hierarchy, or losing face. Much of the time, this indirect approach is trying to avoid saying anything that could be misunderstood, that could result in blame, or it may simply be to show politeness and respect. A very simple example of this would be a boss asking an employee to tidy their desk. They would never just say, Clean your desk, it's a mess. It would always be something along the lines of, I recently read that a professor discovered that a tidy desk increases productivity. Or, they may simply look at the desk, look at the employee, and through a simple look of the eyes, show their disapproval. Both ways avoid being direct and rely on the employee to understand exactly what is being communicated. This approach runs through most, if not all, Japanese communication. That's why it's so important, if you come from a culture that values being direct, to tone down how you speak and also be more conscious in how you listen and what you're listening to, which would include, for example, intonation. Despite our best efforts, sometimes we find ourselves in difficult situations dealing with conflict in one form or another. The Japanese rarely, if ever, lose their tempers and don't show their true emotions, especially if not positive. As a result, the Japanese tend to bury conflicts. They will smile, be polite, and say what is needed in order to save face and preserve harmony. However, inside, they may feel very differently. Asking someone if there's a problem does no good, as it's unlikely they'll want to discuss the issue. The answer will almost invariably be, of course there's no problem. It may be the case that someone holds a grudge, or hides their true feelings for days, weeks, months, or even years. In a commercial relationship, it may be buried until the time to renew contracts, at which time the relationship will be brought to a sudden end with a vague explanation as to why. This is why it's so important to spend time with Japanese colleagues and clients face to face. This gives you opportunities to assess how people are feeling and to understand if there are any potential challenges that need dealing with. So, how should someone non-Japanese go about dealing with this approach to conflict? Well, for one, a direct head-on approach will rarely work unless there's a very strong personal relationship. Most of the time, such an approach will actually make the situation worse as it demonstrates a, a lack of sensitivity which the Japanese would expect in such a situation. There are two ways to go about reconciliation, using an intermediary or nomination. Often, the simplest way of finding out what people are thinking when trying to bring about a reconciliation is to use a third party to talk on your behalf. If there's someone who both parties like and trust, they can be used to work out what the core issues at play are and to liaise with both sides to bring about an agreement that saves both sides face as well as offering a way out of the deadlock. The other way of finding out what people's true feelings are is through nomination, sharing drinks with someone and waiting for a good opportunity to sensitively broach certain topics and share opinions can help cut through many layers of inhibition. Should you understand that you've done something wrong, even if you believe it's not to have been wrong, then you must make sincere apologies. Apologies are extremely important in Japanese culture. 
You will often find people apologising for seemingly harmless actions, such as holding a door open for them. The Japanese are acutely sensitive to the impact they have on others, and over-apologise to constantly try to maintain a sense of harmony. So remember, if you're working with the Japanese, it might be up to you to try and assess whether there are issues with the relationship. Usually, clues in the way they communicate or changes in behaviour can point towards potential challenges behind the scenes. Use an indirect, diplomatic and conciliatory approach to resolving the conflict. Understanding body language is an important part of communication in Japan. As we covered previously, it's body language and other forms of non-verbal communication that fill in the information gaps in high-context, indirect cultures. The Japanese use a number of gestures to communicate, and often their hands can say all that needs to be said. For example, Rather than say no or give a negative answer to a question, a Japanese person might put a hand on their head and give a loud puff of breath. <sighs> this essentially is saying no without saying no. Similarly, when the Japanese want to express they can't understand something, rather than say it, they wave a hand in front of their face. One thing you won't find the Japanese doing is pointing, as this is considered extremely rude. As such, rather than point with fingers, you should use an open palm to point in the direction you wish. If you wish to gesture someone to come, you should use the whole palm facing down and draw the fingers back like such. Again, make sure you don't use a single finger, as this can come across as rude. When communicating with the Japanese, you may sometimes find people using grunts, sighs, sounds and other forms to show engagement with what you're saying. On occasion, this can be quite exuberant, but should not be taken in any way other than positively. Showing effort and willing is extremely important in Japanese culture. When people want to show interest in what you're saying, they'll often use sounds to demonstrate this. Doing the same in your own way can sometimes also aid communication. A final point on body language is to be careful with eye contact. The Japanese have an aversion to strong and prolonged eye contact. It's felt to be aggressive and invasive. Make sure you don't interpret a lack of eye contact as being evasive or secretive, and also ensure you break up eye contact when speaking with people. So. In this chapter, we've covered the fact that context is crucial in communication for the Japanese, and as a result, they are very indirect in how they speak. Nonverbal communication is just as, if not more important, than what is spoken, so always be in tune with body language and similar means of expression. Finally, we looked at how the Japanese use body language and gestures to communicate avoiding the need for the spoken word. In this final chapter, we'll be focusing on some practical tips around etiquette that can help you make a positive first impression when working in Japan or with the Japanese. As a foreigner, you won't be expected to know all the intricacies of all Japanese customs and protocol. However, there are some basics that are really useful to know, and this is what we'll be focusing on now. First, let's start with what to wear. Well, the first thing to note is that the Japanese take appearances seriously. They expect people to be well-groomed and presentable at all times. For men, this means dark-coloured suits such as grey or black with a shirt and tie. Stay well away from outlandish colours. Standing out in Japan, especially in the professional context, is not seen positively. Looking like the team is seen positively. Women should also wear a dark coloured suit and business skirt of a moderate length along with a white shirt. Trousers on women are not generally viewed as acceptable. Well polished shoes are important and even more important are your socks. If you're in Japan, you may sometimes be required to remove your shoes, so 
Always make sure you pack your freshest pairs of socks to avoid any embarrassment. When meeting people and addressing people in general, the rules are very simple to follow. Always use a person's surname followed by san. So, Mr. Tanaka would be Tanaka-san, and Mrs. Ito would be Ito-san. There are other words that the Japanese use with names, however, san is the most common and the most appropriate for you to use in professional circles. Remember, always stick to surnames until you're invited to use first names. Some Japanese may jump to this immediately, others not. A confusing aspect of Japanese culture and etiquette is the bow. Although the Japanese don't expect foreigners to understand or even engage in bowing, many people like to at least understand its basic rules in order to better know what to do in certain situations. Bowing is critically important among the Japanese. It's used on a daily basis to show and receive respect and to preserve hierarchy, status and harmony. The specifics of who bows when, how low and for how long are complex and related to many socio-economic factors as well as context. At its most basic level, the lower you bow and the longer you bow for, the more respect you're showing to the other person due to their status or if you want to show gratitude. Now remember, you may meet many Japanese who do not bow when meeting you. They'll use a handshake and possibly a pronounced nod. However, when someone Japanese does bow, and you want to bow back, you need to know how low to bow. So if you were in a restaurant and the waitress bows to you, you can either give a small nod of the head or a small bow. What's important is not to bow lower than they did. This to them will mean they have to bow again to you even lower to show respect back. As you are the guest of the restaurant, you have the highest status, so therefore the need to bow as low or even at all is not there. If you meet someone of a similar status to you, such as a business peer, the bow must be equal in angle and length. If, however, the person is senior to you, such as a company boss or a client, you must bow first and also bow low to show respect. On top of this, you need to also time your bow to be long enough to be respectful and not short enough to be disrespectful. Over time, through experience and also watching those around you, the subtle details of how, when and why to bow will become easier for you to engage in. Business cards are very symbolic in Japan, closely tied with their culture of ink, paper, writing and calligraphy. The business card in some ways has come to represent its owner. As a result, business cards are still really important in Japanese professional circles. Always make sure you treat a Japanese person's business card with the utmost respect. Never write on it. Don't fiddle with it. Don't put it into your trouser pockets or wallet. And also, don't hold it with your hand covering the writing. When someone's giving you their card, make a small nod of the head and use both hands to receive the card, giving the gesture a small sense of ceremony. Immediately inspect the card and comment on it in any way you can. Just showing interest in the card is what's needed. If you're sitting at a table, leave the card face up on the table until the end of the meeting. If you want to make a very good impression, then think about where you're going to put someone's card at the end of a meeting. Bringing something special or luxurious, such as a nice card holder or a piece of silk cloth which you place their business card, will give the owners of the card immense face. Another important part of Japanese business culture that involves exchange is gift giving. The Japanese love to give gifts, not only in business, but with friends and family as well. Sharing gifts is a common way across many cultures of creating trust, nurturing relationships, and strengthening bonds between people. If you're travelling to Japan or welcoming Japanese guests in your own country, think about some gifts from your local area, region, or country. 
The Japanese love edibles, but also anything such as art, crafts, and other forms of cultural expression. Anything that represents your identity and also gives a message to the Japanese will always be received in the most positive spirit. If you're ever planning on giving a gift that is very expensive or special, it's a good idea to indirectly inform the Japanese side of your intention. They'll then also want to bring a gift so as to avoid embarrassment at not being able to reciprocate on the spot. Be aware that in Japan it's normal to wait for the givers of gifts to have gone before they're opened. This helps both sides avoid any awkwardness should the gift be too much or too little. So, if you're giving a gift, you can mention what it is and the symbolism behind it, but then leave it for the hosts to open later if they want. If you're given a gift, ask if you should open it there and then. If the answer is very diplomatic, this usually means it's best for you to wait until they've left. The Japanese love their food, and as you can guess by now, Japanese culture is full of a series of intricate behaviours around the eating and sharing of food. Again, as a foreigner, you'll not be expected to know them all, but here are a couple that will save you from any potential embarrassment. Firstly, if you eat with chopsticks, then never leave them sticking into a bowl of food. This is associated with funeral rites. They should be placed on the edges of your bowl or on special holders. Similarly, also make sure that you never pass food to other people with your chopsticks. The Japanese always pour drinks for one another, so always allow people to pour your drinks for you, and always make sure you reciprocate by pouring their drinks for them. Tipping in Japanese restaurants is not the custom. For the Japanese working in the industry, they see service as their job, Getting paid extra for it is viewed as unnecessary. If you do leave a tip, be ready for the waiter or waitress to try and give it back to you. Lastly, let's cover some basics in terms of public behaviour. Speaking loudly in Japan is considered very rude, so when in public, always try to speak in low, respectful tones. Speaking on your mobile phone in some public places is even frowned upon. Avoid blowing your nose in public, and if you do blow it, be aware that the Japanese consider handkerchiefs to be very unhygienic. Physical touch between people is minimised, especially outside friends and family. If you come from a tactile culture, be aware that putting your arm around people Patting people on the back and standing very close to people when talking are not done in Japan. Make sure you keep your distance and show respect. Well, this brings us to the end of this chapter, and nearly to the end of the course. How you carry yourself and present yourself is a serious business in Japan. Always be mindful of your behaviour and conscious of how you may be coming across. If you do make mistakes, Remember, apologies are everything in Japan. In the last chapter, we'll be summarising some of the main themes and learning points of the course. This brings us to the end of our course on Japanese culture. In summary, some of our key learning points are that it's important to approach Japan with an open mind and to make sure we don't look at everything through our own cultural lenses. We've learned about the important role that history and religion play in explaining many of the facets of Japanese culture and behaviours. We've placed a lot of stress upon the importance given to group harmony, face, manners and expected behaviours, as these are commonly an area many foreigners do not fully appreciate. Lastly, we learnt some of the main etiquette considerations to ensure that when you're in the country, you're able to understand at least some of the more important rules of conduct. We'd like to thank you for taking our course. We encourage you to enjoy your time in this very unique part of the world.